Hey everybody, and welcome to the Suburban Garage Workshop. Today we're going to talk about French cleats, kind of a little French cleat 101. I'm going to show you how I built my French cleats, and I'm going to show you some uh, do's and don'ts about building French cleats. Talk about uh, what kind of material to use, the spacing I use, why it's important to have something to back up those cleats, and um, we'll talk about that. And uh, just kind of give you a rundown. Um, thanks and I appreciate it. Here we go. So what we're going to use to make our sample cleats here, this is three quarter inch um, red oak faced um, plywood that we bought to do our laundry room cabinets with. Um, this is just scrap I have left over, so it's just the perfect size to cut down um, to show you how I do French cleats. Now you don't have to use plywood, you can use pine. Um, all my walls are done in pine. I don't have any pine, it's cold outside, I'm not going to go into the store. So we're going to use the scrap we already have. So this is, like I said, three quarter inch uh, oak faced plywood, but it doesn't have to be. You can use virtually anything. Um, any kind of solid wood that's not gonna disintegrate with that kind of load. So I wouldn't use anything like chipboard, MDF, particle board, um, but you can use any kind of hardwood. You can use pine. You can use any kind of quality plywood. This is, this plywood I believe came from Nards or Home Depot. It's not uh, birch, um, you know, Baltic birch, but it's fine for cleats. It's going to work just fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut this down. And my cleats are about eh, three and a quarter inch, three and a quarter inch um, in width. So what I'm going to do is I want to get two cleats out of each one of these. So I'm basically going to measure this out, and I can either use a tape measure or I can use a little gauge here on the DeWalt. And I'm going to come in at just a hair over six and a half. So I'm going to lock this in because I need to cut this down um, to that kind of that double measurement plus the width of the blade so I can kind of get two cleats out of each board. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the blade up. Now I'm not doing kind of a double method. I just do a single, a single bevel on my cleats and I'll explain a little bit of that a little bit later. But here I'm just kind of got the teeth right above the, right above the blade. This is a combo blade. This is a 60 tooth, um, 60 tooth combo blade. And it's got a flat, it's got a, every like fifth tooth is a flat raker blade. So it kind of leaves a flat bottom. So if I'm using this to make dados and stuff, it works really good. This is kind of my general purpose blade I use for everything. So with that, let me go ahead and uh, get some uh, ear protection on, fire up the, uh, the, the uh, dust extractor, and we'll go ahead and cut this down. Okay, so what I have here is two pieces cut down. Um, they're cut down to, let's see what our final measurement here was. Final measurement here is about six and a half inches. Um, I like my cleats on the walls to be like two and a half, over two and a half inches in thickness. Um, that is from bottom edge to top of bevel. And the reason I do that is because I think you need, I really like to use two screws. And if you put the screws too close together, as they go into the stud, you're not getting as much holding force. So I like to use at least two and a half inches. I really think over three inches is better. You can go to four inches, but I think at that point, you're just, it's kind of overkill unless you're putting extremely heavy loads on it. So I think somewhere in that three inch range is probably the perfect size for, for cleat. And that's from bottom edge of cleat to top of, bottom edge of the cleat to the top of the bevel, okay? So now that we have these cut down to about six and a half inches, we're gonna go ahead and cut these right down the middle um, at a 45 degree, and that'll give us two cleats out of every board. Okay, so next let's go ahead and do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and pull out this insert plate, this zero clearance insert plate. We're gonna pull that plate out, and we're gonna put the factory plate back in, which is the standard DeWalt factory plate, because then I can use this for the bevel. If I try to cut the bevel with my zero clearance plate, it'll just eat up the, it'll eat up the insert plate. So this is why we have to switch to a wider plate when we're going to do the 45. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen this up. We'll be on the stops here. I'm gonna rotate that to 45. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna raise this blade all the way up. Okay, and with the blade raised all the way up, what I'm gonna do is use one of these little level boxes or you know, just basically angle finders to find out to make sure the blade is actually true at 45. Now I've raised this, I've basically 
move this blade to its 45 degree stop. I've raised it all the way up, but that doesn't mean it's at 45. You know, these saws, especially these smaller saws, they can shift, they can lose their kind of alignment. Um, so I'm just gonna recheck this. So with these little angle finder boxes, you can find these cheap, they're like $20 on Amazon or wherever. They're really kind of a neat thing. You kind of put it down on the table and you zero the blade out. Okay, so now that we have the blade dialed in, um, the next thing we do is we're gonna go ahead and drop the blade back down and that way we can get the fence lined up and cut this in half. So, gonna... so my cheater way of lining up this fence to kind of cut this board in half is what I've actually done is I've marked the middle point of this board and then I've gone through with a 45 and marked kind of two cross hashes. And this kind of shows me where that angle of that blade needs to come through. Now, if I push this up and I had the blade extended, I can actually line this up with one of the teeth. Now what you want to do too is use the tooth that's going to, one of the teeth that's going to come up and be like a raker tooth. So it's not aligned to the left or right, but one of the center ones. And you could line that up with that middle, where the middle of that line is, the, the 45 degrees. And that's kind of my quick way of doing it without having to do a bunch of math and figure out exactly where that 45 needs to be. Now when you rotate on some saws, when you rotate that 45 degree angle off, it's not exactly in plane where it is where it's straight. In other words, it doesn't rotate in place 45 this way. A lot of times the blade just leans to the left here. Um, and so you can't just say, I'm gonna move the fence two and a half inches and give it a cut. That doesn't work. Or two, in this case, it's a six and a half inch board, uh, three and a quarter. I can't just set it to three and a quarter. Also then, that doesn't take into account the, the thickness of the blade. So this way is how I do it. Now there's other people that do it where they take in the width of the blade, um, they run through calculations and they come up with exactly the number it needs to be. But every saw tilts a little different. The angle of tilt, depending on the geometry of the mechanism could be different. Um, is this the world's most exact way? Perhaps not, but I've never had an issue with it because I'm visually marking where the middle of this board is and then I'm actually lining it up to one of the flat raker teeth on the blade and you know, you might have to put the blade down so you can slide the board forward enough to be able to come right up on one of those tooths. But I can line that tooth up so that line comes right up the middle of that tooth when they're lined up. And I know I'm pretty much gonna get that right in the middle of that board, okay? So with that, let's go ahead and fire up the uh, dust collector, put on some PPE, and I'm gonna go ahead and cut these. So here's our board cut. We've got our two 45s, and I think they look pretty good. I mean, I think if we came in here and measured this up, they're pretty much dead on even. So once you have all your cleats cut, um, this edge is actually fairly sharp. Um, you probably wanna round this over, or at least break this edge. The same with this other edge here at the bottom too, because it's fairly sharp. I mean, it doesn't take much. I mean, really, you can just take a sanding block and run over the length of it a couple times and just take that sharpness off because then you won't end up getting a splinter in your hand or jamming this over. Some people will actually run this back through the table saw and just cut off like an eighth of an inch just to, because the, the strength is really here. So if you actually take an eighth of an inch or something off the edge of this, this sharp point off, it won't hurt a thing because this is all your surface area and it's a downward force that is holding this cleat, is the strength in this cleat. So what I recommend, I've said, is just run this over with a sanding block a few times just to kind of break that edge so it's not so sharp. The same with this edge too. This edge after it comes off the table saw, very sharp. And because it's on the wall this way, it's easy for you when you're working, if you're reaching over to hit it with the back of your hand or whatever, and that's gonna hurt. And get maybe get you a splinter. So same thing, either round this over or just break it with a, break it with a simple sanding block to take that sharp edge off. Also, it's not a bad idea if you want to just kind of sand these down and give them a smooth finish. Um, and then if you wanted to, you know, varnish these or coat these, you could. Um, mine and my French cleat wall, I just went over these with paste wax. Um, this is just to give it a nice look. It makes the tool holders slide on and off easy. Um, it just kind of gives it a little bit of protection. But I've seen people varnish them. I've seen people paint them. Um, you could stain them. You can do whatever you want. You can leave them raw. It makes no difference. So, but at a minimum, just go over a little sandpaper, break that edge. 
So what I've done here is I've built kind of a mock wall. Um, this is what you would see in an average garage that is unfinished. These is, you know, bottom plate, top plate, and a couple studs that are 16 inches off center. Um, and people have basically taken cleats and mounted those directly to these. And you can do this for certain things. If you were going to hang a cabinet, um, sure, you could do that because the cabinet would touch both of these studs and it wouldn't rock because you could build a back cleat and, and take care of that. But there are problems with using this, what I would call these tool holders that you see here on the wall or fixtures. And I'm gonna show you um, some of the problems with that. First, let me go ahead and attach this and then we'll go ahead and uh, show you what some of those issues could be. Okay, so here you see I've got this cleat attached um, and there's no backing on it. The problem with this is that when you have some kind of fixture or tool holder on here, it can cause a rocking motion and that can cause this cleat to actually bend uh, because there's nothing supporting the bottom edge of this. There's no support on the back of this cleat. Now it's strong over the studs, but it's not strong here between the studs. So for example, if I put this tool holder, and this is just a simple tool holder that I have a hook on for putting a hose on or whatever, um, it's plenty strong in a downward motion but it can bend as the weight. And actually, as I'm pressing on this, I can hear this, this, this cleat actually creaking because I'm actually twisting the entire cleat between the studs. If I move this cleat over here or move this fixture over here and press on it, I don't hear that because it's, this cleat is backed up by this stud. And that's one of the reasons why you want some kind of covering on here, some drywall, um, you know, some kind of plywood or something back on here because one, it gives you gives support to the bottom edge. Now this isn't a very long fixture um, that hold that comes down far enough that needs a back cleat. But if it did, it needs something to prevent that tool or that fixture from swinging backwards. And you think, well, the force is always down. Well, depending on what you have, if you had a shelf or something, the more anything that, the more horizontal something sticks out, that's a leverage action. And the closer that lever action is to the cleat the more that can happen. And I've actually seen stuff kind of cleats actually walk out and fall forward just from vibration because of that lever action that's happening. Also, when you have a lot of weight, as I said, it's, it's, it's twisting this cleat. You can hear it starting to twist from doing that. So you really should have something behind here that's gonna support or back up this cleat to prevent it from twisting and to prevent the, the individual fixtures from rotating under, under that cleat. Now where this wouldn't apply is if you were hanging cabinets, as I said before, where you've got a fixture or some kind of method that's good, it's going through and it's being backed up by the actual studs. Or you put a cleat on here, down here, close enough, now this one doesn't fit obviously, but if you had another cleat close enough where the bottom edge of this fixture was resting on this second cleat, well that gives it more support as well. Now it doesn't give it as much support as if you had drywall behind it or, or work because then this is still unsupported behind it. So I really recommend, I've seen you guys do it and they have great results with it, but I really recommend you have some kind of plywood, some kind of drywall or something behind the surface you're gonna mount these French cleats to. Okay, so here's our mock wall again. The only difference here now is I've sheathed it. Uh, so there's a piece of plywood on here and I've painted it black um, and it kind of mimics my walls up here. Now these walls are drywall, but I had a piece of quarter inch plywood that I just painted black just for illustration here. Normally you'd be dealing with, you know, half inch or three quarter inch drywall or plywood or some kind of sheeting of that kind. But in this case, just quarter inch just for demonstration purposes. What I've done here, I put a piece of blue tape along the bottom and I've done this so I can go through and mark my stud locations. Now it's easy for me to look at the back and figure out exactly where the studs are at on this mock wall, but on a in a real situation, you wouldn't know where those studs are at unless you can see the screw holes or see the nail holes where everything was taped. Um, in this case, let's just print it and you can't. This is my tip, put a piece of tape along the wall. This works great indoors, hanging pictures, hanging anything on a wall, use a piece of tape. That way you're marking the tape you drill your holes, you peel the tape away, there's no marks on the wall, especially in a freshly painted room. Like we just did our laundry room, we just hung cabinets and shelving and everything. This is how I did it, so I didn't mark up those freshly painted walls. So in this case, I'm just gonna go through the stud finder. I'm gonna go through and mark my stud locations. So there's the edge of my stud. So I'm just gonna make a mark down here on my tape. And I'm gonna move over. Oh, and there's my other edge. 
And so that's the center of my stud right there. I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to come over here. There's the edge of my stud. Move over. There's the other edge of my stud. So I know that my stud's right here. The center of my stud is roughly in there. I usually recommend that when you do this, you go one direction and mark it and then repeat it the other way. That way you don't get any false hits. And that helps that helps, helps to ward off false hits from things like pipes and wires and stuff. Usually if it's uh, repeatable two directions, it's usually easy to mark your stud. And you should know what the size of your stud is. You know what time throws me off every once in a while is if you get into a situation in, in wall framing, especially like this is a two-story house where you might have, you know, I've seen as many as five studs stacked together for support. And that, that, that always rigs me out. It's like, why is, there, why is this stud seven inches wide? And that's because there's a stack of studs there that are, that are supporting a, as a support load, a point load for the second floor. So anyway, now that I've got these stud locations marked, I can go ahead and start putting our French cleats up. So I'm going to take our first French cleat, and you're going to hang it up here, and you can then see where your stud locations are at. So then what you can do is you can come in here and drill a couple whole pilot holes in here for your actual screws that you're going to attach this with. So in this case, I've already done that. So here's my stud, or here's my French cleat, and I've already got the holes drilled. Now I drilled these holes slightly, not in a straight line, but slightly off-centered. And that's just so, I think that gives you a little bit more support. It doesn't, you're not putting two screws through basically the same set of fibers in the stud. You're kind of offsetting them. And I think that gives you more support. And I think that gives you more support actually in the cleat as well because you're offsetting this, the load. It's not just one set of holes you're drilling in a horizontal or a vertical manner. So what you're gonna do now is you're gonna go ahead and get this lined up, leveled, and start drilling your screws in. This is where a helper comes in hand. So one tip I can give you is kind of get your, get your, um, get it lined up where your screw hole should be on your studs and actually come in here. In this case, I've got a pin nailer and I'm simply just gonna drive a two inch pin right in between these two screw holes. And now what's happened is now I've got a pivot point. So now I can put a level on here and I can kind of line this up and get it square. And then once I get it square, I can come in and drive another pin over in this hole. And now that's gonna stay in place long enough for me to drill the actual screws or pre-drill the screw holes, drill into the studs if I wanna pre-drill the studs themselves and then put my screws in. So here I've, drawn, I've put some screws in here just to hold this first French cleat. Now this is only quarter inch plywood and I'm going right into a stud here. Um, and I, you wanna make sure these are actually countersunk um, because you don't want the screw head protruding because that's gonna make your fixtures or holders rock on that screw hole. So these need to be countersunk. Um, screw length. You wanna go have enough screw length to go through the cleat, through your sheathing, whether that's drywall or plywood or what have you, and to be at least an inch and a half into that stud. So think about the length. You've got three quarter inches here. You might have three quarter inches of drywall or, or uh, plywood, and you still want an inch and a half. So at a minimum, you're looking at a three inch screw. And I think that's probably a good size screw. Um, I think this is a three and a half or three and a quarter inch screw, construction grade screw. I like the star head screws or whatever the heck they call them. Um, these are SPAX ones, I believe, or GRC, GRX or GRC. Um, I think they drive clean and they don't, you don't wallow them out when you're trying to torque them into, into a hole. And if you have to remove them later, you can remove them because you didn't strip the heads off of them, okay? So star, star head bits or star head screws, godsend. I use them all the time, wherever possible on, on most of my projects. Um, star head wood screws, whatever I need. I really like these kind of screws, okay? So let's talk about mounting our next ones and what kind of spacing we should have between our studs because, or start spacing between our French cleats, I should say, because I see a lot of people who mount these in different ways. And I wanna talk about that really quickly. Okay, so what I've done is I've just used a couple clamps right here just to put this second French cleat. And you notice how there's all this space here. And I see that a lot when people mount French cleat walls and I don't understand why you don't need this much space. Um, the only time I would see you would need this much space is if you were mounting a cabinet, where you have the cabinet here and this bottom cleat is, is picking up the bottom edge of that cabinet or another cleat on the bottom of that cabinet. 
But otherwise, this is wasted space. So why wouldn't you have another cleat in the middle? So I want to show you an example of why also I do not recommend you have this much space in between your cleats. So here's my fixture. This was hanging on a wall. I just took it off. This holds all my uh, squeezy clamps. And it's basically just one by material with a cleat screwed on the top of it. And if I stick it on here, the problem is there's no support here on this back edge. So what I see a lot of people do is they put a little spacer screwed on here to make up that space so this thing doesn't rock. Otherwise, this thing can rock. You can see how badly you can rock and things start falling off, as you see. So they'd have to put some kind of a spacer. So they would come in here with some, you know, one by material or three quarter inch material and stick behind here to space it so that the bottom edge of this thing is supported against the wall. Whereas if I had another cleat in here, that cleat acts as that support for me. So I wouldn't need to do that. Um, also, it gives me more flexibility. So instead of mounting something here or mounting something here, I can mount something here or here or here. It gives me a lot more options. So what's how, how I'm going to mount this? So on this section of wall, we're going to have we're going to have three cleats. And so let's show you how I how I mount those and how I space those out. Okay. So we're back to our single cleat here again. And what I want to do is I want to space these and I want to keep the spacing pretty even. I know this one is actually level. We've measured it out. It's perfectly level. So my perfect spacing for this size cleat, section of two by four. Um, it works perfectly. And since it's flat, it makes it really easy to support that second cleat so you can get it in place. Um, and I can do the same thing. I can come in with a pin nailer and pin nail this. But before I do that, what I'm simply going to do is lay this cleat over the cleat below it. And then I can use this to come in with a, and I can use a straight edge with a level or something and mark my screw locations so I know exactly where I need to pre-drill those screws to transfer into the studs. So I can just keep doing that using a straight edge off the bottom two screws and I can just work my way up the wall. So now that I have my screw holes marked, I can come in here, line this back up and I can come in here with a level and make sure I'm in place and then I can pin nail this, drill it, and screw it in place. So let's go ahead and do that next. Okay, there we go. Looks kind of similar to my wall up here. So what we've got here is three cleats now, um, and I can hang anything on any level. So if I pick something up off my wall here, these are my chisels, I can hang the chisels here, I can hang the chisels here, or I can hang the chisels down here if I had enough room and I wasn't all the way down on the workbench here. But that gives you flexibility, and it gives you flexibility to move things when you're running projects. So there's a lot of times there's tools I don't use very often, and I will put those up high out of the way. And when I need them and I'm working on something, I can move them down low, use them because now they're handy. And when I'm done with that project, I can move them back up high and keep them out of the way. That's the beauty of French cleat system is you're not, you're not locked in to keeping things, you know, dead center or dead locked into a square you've screwed it into a wall. But here's another example of a fixture that I built. Now, people have asked me about this. This is just Rockler foam hold, that you cut out in the shape and it holds this stuff. But same thing, I can move this around, pull it down when I need it, and it hangs on the wall wherever I need it to hang. So that's why I like having cleats that are more cleats spaced closer together. Two by four, perfect spacer. So I want to show you something that I kind of learned the hard way. When I was building fixtures, I didn't understand the leverage effect of where the cleat is in relation to the load. And this was an early fixture I built. I still use it. I'm actually going to tear it apart and redo it. This holds a Bluetooth speaker. And if I turn it, you can kind of see the construction of it a little bit. And it's basically just a shelf. And it's shelf and it's got a cleat attached to the back of the shelf. The problem is the center line of rotation of where the shelf is, is almost exactly where the 45 is. And that's bad. Um, French cleats get their strength 
from gravity in a straight downward force. That is the strongest, and that's what makes them the strongest load, is when they're holding something flat against the wall and the load is going straight down. It's almost impossible to break them at that load. But when you have a horizontal load where you're bringing it out, this is a leverage effect. And now you, the point of rotation is right here where the, where the two, basically the two 45s, that leading edge of the 45s. To give you an idea, if I simply press down on the edge of this, you see how this thing walks itself out of the 45 and the fixture fails. How do I know? I've had it happen. I've been inside the house and I've heard a crash and I've come down and found the speaker on the ground. I've been out here working, I've had music playing and the vibration was enough to work this thing forward and off the shelf. And the problem is, is because I've got this load way too close to here. I've even seen fixtures people put together where they've got the shelves up here above this. The lower you can bring that load below that, that 45, the stronger it's going to be. This is also why you should have a backing on here that extends down as far as possible. In a perfect world, you would want that fixture to come down and touch the, the edge or somewhere along the next cleat or, or have a spacer that touches the wall here. The lower you can bring that horizontal load, you're moving that point of rotation down here. And that one, if it's rotating down here, it's not rotating up here. So you still have all that downward force that's holding that firmly into the cleat. Whereas up here, you can see one little touch and it pops right out of that cleat. And I've seen that. Um, like I said, I've heard it. I've come out and found it. I've watched it fall off. Um, and I still haven't rebuilt it just because I haven't got around to it. Um, but that is one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to redo this, take the cleat off the back, redo this back piece, back plate. Oops. See, it just did it again. Perfect example. And I'm going to make this taller so the cleat's moving up. Another example, another thing I've learned is when I was building all of these the first time, I basically have the same size cleat that I have to the wall. I was putting on the back of the fixtures. Now you want the same thickness. So if you're doing three quarter inch cleat, you want to use three quarter inch cleat here. But this cleat doesn't need to be the same height as the one on the wall. So if you look at this early one I built, it's full length and it's that thick. <laughs> it doesn't need to be that thick. So if I look at a later one that I built that is even more rock solid, this is my one that I showed you a little while ago that holds these um, squaring tools you'll notice a big difference in how the cleats are. The cleats are much smaller. They're only like two inches. That's all we need. Because the 45 is holding all the load. You just need enough screwing surface to screw into the back. This is not heavy. This weighs maybe a pound. Um, and it's really just, you know, half inch plywood, a box with foam and these things in it. You don't need a cleat that runs the full length also. These two little blocks are more than enough to hold it. Um, and the other thing I typically don't do, I've kind of learned from rebuilding these and reworking these, is I don't glue the cleats on anymore. If I was building something that was really heavy, that wasn't going to move, that was more or less permanent, except hanging on a cleat, then maybe I'd glue it on like a cabinet or something. But these tool holders, the great thing about them is tools come and go. Your space requirements come and change, you know, they change. And two, two wood screws to the back of here is plenty strong. This isn't 50 pounds. This is a pound and a half. I can unscrew these and move these around and reconfigure these whenever I want, and it's flexible. The frame itself is just pin nailed, and that's all the support it needs to hold it together because it's got a full plywood backing on it. And then the foam just sits in here. The foam is um, cut to size, shoved in here with some spray glue to keep the foam adhered to the back, and then the tools are, are basically marked, marked and cut out and pressed in a little smaller than the tool because you want some tension on the foam to hold everything in place. But the point of this was to show you these cleats, that you don't need a full length cleat and you don't need a full thickness cleat. So now all the new tool holders I'm building, I'm building these cleats much smaller and they're perfectly fine. The other thing it does now too is because the cleat isn't three and a half inches or three and a quarter inches, the point where the cleat attaches is higher. 
which now means the load is way down here. The center of gravity of this whole tool is way down here. So you're not going to have that issue that I showed you with, with this thing of it rocking and falling out because most of the weight is below the point of rotation on here. And that's what I want to show you. Okay, well, that's my kind of little introduction and French cleat 101. Um, if you have any questions, put them down in the comments. Um, I might build some different fixtures and things, and I'll, I'll document how I build some of those fixtures. If you have questions in regards to any of the fixtures you see here, um, you know, leave me a comment. Also, subscribe. Press that, uh, press that bell button. So when I do post no content, you'll be informed about it. I appreciate you watching, and uh, talk to you again soon. Thanks.